Hello beautiful people. In this guide I will go through the different US dive bomber models. Hope you enjoy. All the dive bombers will be reviewed in the following manner. First there will be a short introduction, then I'll go over some of the pros and cons, followed by a look at the armament and secondary weapons. Then I will show you how to aim with the different types of bombs while dive bombing. And lastly, there will be some pew pew and final remarks. You can in general describe the US dive bombers like this. They are fairly maneuverable, have decent speed for what they are, have good to excellent offensive armament, they also have good secondary weapons options, all have some degree of armor protection, and they all have self sealing fuel tanks. The individual dive bomber will have a timestamp so you can jump between them. First off, why dive bombing in the first place? In real life and in War Thunder, when you dive bomb, you increase the accuracy of the bomb since it simplifies the trajectory of the bomb itself. Another advantage is that you do not lose sight of your target, which greatly helps when trying to hit moving targets like a ship, a vehicle, or simply chasing a Twitch streamer down the street. You consider dive bombing when you dive towards a target from about a 45 degree angle and up. A lot of dive bombers in War Thunder are capable of dive bombing up to around 80 degrees plus and be very accurate. In order to help slow down the aircraft and stabilize it in such a steep diving angle are the dive brakes. They work by creating more drag on the plane and thereby slowing it down. The dive brakes are most commonly for World War II air aircraft located under the wings but can also be found at the trailing edges of the wings and on the upper side of the wings. After World War II, the art of dive bombing was not really needed anymore, since the way of aiming the bombs in the first place were increasingly becoming more accurate. What you find on post World War II aircraft are speed brakes, also called air brakes. But the end result is really the same in increasing the drag on the aircraft and thereby slowing it down. The first dive bomber the US has access to is the Battle Rating 1.0 SB2U-2. This dive bomber is also found in the British and French tech trees. For Britain it is called V145B1 and for France V156F. The aircraft itself is identical across the nations but there are smaller differences in weaponry, bomb loads and the dive brakes. So in case you're also using the other nations, the guide for the US SP-2U will also work for the two other aircraft. I'm not going to review the better rating 1.0 SP-2U-2, but instead the upgraded version of better rating 1.7, the SP-2U-3. The reason is pretty simple. Although the flight performance of both models are identical and so are the bomb loads, the better rating 1.7 version is vastly superior when it comes to the armament. It's actually a beast compared to the first version of Better Rating 1.0. And I can tell you right away, as soon as you can, upgrade from the SB2U-2 to the SB2U-3. Let's look at some of the pros and cons. Some of the pros. Bomb load. Both models have for the Better Rating and the plane itself considering great bomb loads, and I'll come back to that in a bit. Armament. The better rating 1.0 model, and this is the only place the differences between the two models are found, has two brown light machine guns offensively and a light machine gun defensively. This SB2U-3 however has four heavy browning machine guns offensively and a heavy browning machine gun defensively. A huge difference in firepower. Die breaks. Although obvious and already mentioned, it's still a pro. And some of the cons. Flight characteristics. Both of the SB2Us are slow. Top speed for them both is just 360 km an hour with a bomb load and 370 km an hour empty. This speed is reached at 4000 meters, so at least it can be used in air battles. Turn time says 22 seconds empty, but it feels a fair bit slower, especially at lower speeds. The wing limits are great though, with almost 750 km an hour and those are also needed. And landing flaps are also ridiculously strong with 700 km an hour. I don't think I have ever seen a higher number on a prop plane before for landing flaps. I could be wrong though. I don't know. Whatever. That being said, the SP2Us have no landing flaps or takeoff flaps. 
The limit for the landing gear is also very high with 440 km an hour and I assume it was needed for some hard dick landings. Wait, did it just say dick landings or dick landings? Dick landing. Anyhow, it's slow, has a slow rate of roll and turning. If you however get it past 270 km an hour, it behaves much better. Bomb aiming. Depending on the bomb and where it is located, the point of aim shifts, but I will come back to that in a bit. Armor protection. There's no real armor protection, and what I think is radio equipment though is on the X-ray marked as armor, but it's only 3mm thick, which means nothing, since it won't even stop a light machine gun bullet. Rate of climb. And here the struggle is real. The stat cut is about 6.2 meters a second empty and about 4 meters a second with a bomb load. That does not sound too awful, but when you play it, it's pretty bad. From takeoff and getting to a height of 1000 meters in mixed battles is a struggle, and you often either have to side climb or climb in circles in order to get over the battlefield at that altitude. The rear gunner of the sp 2 u 3 has a Browning M2 12.7mm heavy machine gun. For such a low battery rating, it's a quite heavy defensive weapon. This M2 can use three different kinds of belts, but just use the universal belt, since that belt mostly contains a highly effective armor-piercing incendiary tracer bullet. The M2 has a good rate of fire with 750 rounds per minute, and the gun has 350 rounds of ammo, which is just fine. The position has, on paper, excellent guidance with plus minus 90 degrees horizontally, and even better plus 90 and minus 30 degrees vertically. But as usual in game with rear gunners, it's a little different in reality, well, or game reality. The gunner cannot aim to the immediate left or right of the vertical stabilizer, and even above the stabilizer there's a rather large dead zone. Vertically, it's actually pretty good. Offensively, the SP2U-3 is actually pretty amazing. It has in fact the heaviest offensive armament of any US aircraft until you are better rating 2.3, find the P400 and the P40s and others at better rating 2.7. And those aircraft are fighter aircraft, not a slow dive bomber. This aircraft has four Browning heavy machine guns in the wings, two in each, with a very impressive 1600 rounds total. With a recent increase in armor pin for most weapons found on aircraft, the US 50 cal has become even more ridiculous than it already was. The best belt to use is the universal belt, since it contains both the armor piercing and incendiary rounds. I do not recommend using the ground belt, since that belt does not include the incendiary round. For a better rating 1.0 or 1.7 dive bomber, the secondary weapons options are pretty good. The maximum amount of TNT that can be dropped is just over half a ton with a single Mark 13 mine. Luckily and oddly enough, the C mine can also be used in mixed battles and is very effective for that purpose. The second largest bomb load TNT wise is the single 1000 pound bomb. The other bomb loads contain either 100 and 250 pound bombs located under the wings in combination with a 500 pound bomb found under the fuselage. The bombs under the wings drop first and at the same time, and the center on the bomb drops separately after. You can dive bomb using several methods. You can just put the plane into a straight dive, but using that method can be tricky depending on the type of aircraft, and often the instructor will fight you as well. You can also, as I always do, roll over into a steep dive almost directly over the target. This is, in my opinion, the best way to use the dive bombers, but it also takes more practice to get it right consistently. Depending on the aircraft and the nation, but I will come back to that specifically when required, I always start the roll when I see the target close to the leading edge of the wing. This means that you will dive towards the target pretty steeply, even if you happen to have a bad roll. With a bad roll, I mean it takes you a longer time to roll over the plane into the dive itself. The longer time you spend rolling over, the more horizontal distance to the target you'll get. That means that the angle of the dive itself is being reduced, which again means that it will shift the point of aim. Do not try to do this type of dive bombing unless you are 900 meters or more above the target. The altitude will ensure that you will have enough time after you have completed the roll to find the target again, aim at it, and get out of the dive with a good amount of altitude to spare. But no matter what, 
Target fixation will get you killed, so if you do not find the target quickly, pull out of the dive and just try again. Your speed is also important and the speed needed to be able to roll over quickly is different from plane to plane. In case of the SB2U, try not to be below 220 km an hour and preferably above 250 km an hour before you start to roll. I would say 220 km an hour is the bare minimum. The faster you are, the faster you can roll over and thereby more quickly get into a good steep dive. Okay, so rolling over, finding the target, and I'm using the wing bombs only. On the SB2 use, it requires you to aim in front of the target. How much depends on your diving angle, but as you can see here, it's pretty much as good as it can get. And I'm aiming a couple of targets length in front of it. And it's pretty much dead on. With the center mounted 500 pound bombs, if you get a really good steep dive, you can basically point the reticle directly onto the target. The increase in TNT in the larger bomb should also ensure that if you do not hit it directly, you will still destroy it. If you have a bad roll and get into a more shallow dive, you need to again aim in front of the target some. It's pretty much impossible for me to say how much though, it really depends on the diving angle. But as usual, practice makes perfect. One thing to note, the center mounted bombs are held in a cradle that will swing forward to clear the bomb of the propeller. It takes a second for the swing to be completed, so remember to keep the reticle on the target for a second or so after you have hit the bomb release key. With the larger 1000 pound bomb and the sea mine, even with a more shallow dive, you can just aim it directly at the target. The larger bombs have a different trajectory than the smaller ones and have even larger TNT content, so you can allow to miss for some distance and either still destroy or damage your target or targets. You can also, more for the fun factor than being useful, use the telescopic sight. Here it is important to get as much altitude as possible first, since it can take time to find your target using the telescopic sight. I suggest to only use it for the center mounted bomb slow, since you can use the sight to just aim directly at the target. Using the sight with the wing mounted bombs is trickier and takes longer time, since you need to figure out how much to lead for the target. But you lose the overview when zoomed in, and it can be more disorientating than beneficial. In any case, you need to be quick about it or you will kiss the ground. It can be used in mixed battles where it can be difficult to find a vehicle which is blended in with the surroundings. In that case, the sight can be a useful tool. But again, you need to be quick about it and have good altitude. Of course, an easier and more obvious way to use it is in naval battles against ships. When using the SB2U Jet 3 in air battles, the usefulness as a base bomber is limited. Even with the sea mine, you can just about destroy a base around the battle rating, and you will often be in up tiers, which makes the bomb loads for base bombing even more useless. But you should still be able to destroy at least two thirds of a base. What happens after you have dropped the bombs on a base is just as fun. You can easily use the plane as a bomber hunter and lure enemy fighters into a head-on, which you will most likely win with the 450 cals. In general, and that goes for all game modes, the most important thing about this plane is the speed. Do not, and I repeat, do not get below 270 km an hour if possible. Below that speed, the plane becomes awful to handle and it basically turns into a flying brick. Above 270 km an hour, the SB2Us behave much better. It's still slow and somewhat heavy, but you can definitely deal with it a lot better.
You can also use the 50 cal for strafing ground targets. Here the 1600 rounds of ammo will go a long way and you can definitely rack up a lot of ground kills with them. In mixed battles, the dive bomber is also very good. Here you can just choose to go for the biggest bang with the C mine, get into a good dive and aim directly at whatever you want gone, and that's about it. The only downside with the C mine and the 1000 pound bomb is that you only get one drop. If you feel more confident with your diving bombing abilities, use the option with the two 250 pound bombs and the center mounted 500 pound bombs. The banks will be smaller, but you will have two chances for destroying vehicles. After you have dropped the bombs or bomb, remember to keep up the speed and then go strafe vehicles. At this low battle rating you can pin a lot of light tanks from the sides, not only from the top down. And of course all SBAGs will have no chance at all. At battle rating 2.0, we have the SPD-3 Dauntless. Dauntless is such a cool name for an aircraft. Just by the way it looks, the Dauntless has always been one of my favorites. In World Thunder, it also turns out to be an excellent dive bomber and attacker. The Dauntless is in many ways an upgrade over the SB-2U-3, but also a downgrade in others. Let's look at some of the pros and cons. Some of the pros, flight characteristics, the Dauntless can reach a top speed of 439 km an hour at 5,700 meters. That is a good deal faster than the SB2U's 360 km an hour. Turn time MT is 25 seconds and 29 seconds with a bomb load. The wing limits are also higher with 740 km an hour. Unlike the SB2U's, the Dauntless has a full set of flaps. Combat and takeoff flap limits are higher with 490 and 469 km an hour. Landing flap limits are also good with 320 km an hour. And again, we find great landing gear limits with 450 km an hour for carrier operations. Did you see what I just did? I avoided saying the D landing. In general, the Dauntless is a better handling aircraft compared to the SB2Us. Armament. The SPD has two heavy machine guns offensively and twin light machine guns for the rear gunner. Dive brakes. The dive brakes of the Dauntless are very effective, with a much larger surface area than the dive brakes of the SB2Us. Armor protection. The pilot has a piece of armor glass protecting his pretty face and an armor plate protecting his back. The rear gunner also has an armor plate protecting his chest and the twin light machine gun mount also has some armor that will protect the face of the gunner. Rate of climb. 
The SPD has a much improved rate of climb over the SP2 use with almost 10 meters a second empty and 7 meters a second with a bomb load. And some of the cons, bomb load. The Dauntless has slightly less options bomb load wise compared to the SP2 use. Armament. Although having two heavy machine guns offensively is great, they have much less ammo compared to the SP2U Death 3. The twin light machine guns for the rear gunner is also a downgrade from the SP2U's Death 3's heavy machine gun firepower wise. The rear gun of the Dauntless has this cool looking twin light machine gun setup. It consists of two brownie light machine guns. They have a good rate of fire with 1000 rounds per minute. Each gun has 1000 rounds of ammo, which is more than plenty. The guns only have access to two types of belts, and honestly, either will do. But you might as well use the only unlockable belt, the armored target's belt. But the only difference is that the armored target's belt does not have the standard ball bullet, but only contains the tracer, AP, and incendiary bullets. The guns have exceptionally good virtual guidances with plus minus 120 degrees. Vertically it's more modest but still fine with plus 60 and minus 5 degrees. In practice the horizontal guidances are pretty crazy, but it can become very handy. You can even try to place yourself next to a bomber and try to broadside him with a turret. Otherwise it's like the SP2U with blind spots to the left and right of the vertical stabilizer and barely any gun depression at all. So although they are fast firing and you have two of them, they are even combined not nearly as powerful as the single browning heavy machine gun found on the SP2U Death 3. On the other hand you will likely hit more often with this setup and maybe scare off the pursuing fighter for a bit. Offensively the Dauntless has two browning heavy machine guns. They each sadly only have 180 rounds of ammo, so 360 total. Of course the effect on a target when you hit is good, but it would have been nice if you had slightly more ammo available for them. An improvement over the SP2 Death 3 is that they are located in the fuselage, so you do not have to worry about the gun convergence. The secondary armament, although with less bomb load options than the SP2 use, is more interesting. The Dauntless can either carry two wing mounted 100 pound bombs and a center mounted 1000 pound bomb or a single C mine. In addition to the two bomb loads, you can also opt for four additional Browning Heavy Machine Guns in gun parts. With the gun parts, the Dauntless will have six heavy machine guns with a total of 1720 rounds. Pew pew. With the SPD-3, it's much easier to get to altitude and speed compared to the SP-2 use. Here you will not have any issues getting past the 220 km an hour I suggest as a minimum speed, nor the minimum height of 900 meters. If you happen to roll over very fast, you can get into an almost 90 degree dive towards the target, but then it becomes impossible to line up the aircraft and the instructor will fight you a lot. In that case, just abort the dive and do not drop any bombs. Chances are very low that you will hit anything. Even if you manage to stabilize the plane because of the bomb's trajectory, you will overshoot the target. The two 100 pound wing mounted bombs drop first and one at a time, starting up with the left bomb first. The smaller bombs are a little finicky, but in general if you get into a good dive, they basically land where you aim the reticle. If you want to try obsess about it, like I do, you can try aim slightly to the right and left of the target to try offset the placement of the bombs under the wings themselves. It of course does not always work, but it's a bonus when it does. So if drop single, you can have three separate bomb drops with the SPD-3. The 100 pound bombs are pretty small though. So you can easily just drop both of them by hitting the bomb release key twice for trying to knock out a tank. But if you aim for an SPAG or any open top vehicle, just using one of the bombs should be enough for a kill. Just always keep in mind that they are not laser guided and there will always be deviations, but you can get them pretty close if you are consistent. The center mounted 1000 pound bomb I found drop a little different than the one on the SP2 use. Here, if you're in a good dive, you can aim slightly below the target, maybe half a target's worth if you aim for a sensor hit. 
Again, it's just me obsessing. But even if you aim just directly at the target, it will still be a very close to a direct hit and it will certainly destroy the target. You can also use the telescopic sight for the Dauntless, and here you can better use the wing mount to bounce with the sight. Compared to the SB2U, you don't have to aim above the target. And again, just remember not to get target fixated, it will get you killed. In air battles, you usually end up in the same battles as with the SP2U-3 battle rating wise. This means that you can destroy a base around your battle rating on a regular map, but you will not be able to on an operations map. Remember that the two wing bombs drop separately and you need to hit the bomb release key three times in order to drop all of the bombs unless you set a series key. Once you have dropped the bombs, you can go bomber hunting with your 250 cals or do a bit of ground pounding. Not too much though, since you do not have a lot of ammo for them. Another great way to use the Dauntless is for spawning in with the gun pods instead. You already spawn at bomb altitude and from then on, it's just about trying to find some bombers to destroy with your now great firepower. Now witness the firepower of this fully armed and operational Dauntless. Here you can argue that the SP2U-3 is even better, since you can do both. First attack bombers, then still be able to destroy a base, and then go ground pounding after with still plenty of ammunition to spare. For mixed battles, the Dauntless is also good and better than the SB2U-3 as a dive bomber. It's faster, handles better and the bombs are easier to aim with since the models have the same point of aim. Furthermore, you can have three separate bomb drops compared to the SB2U's two. You do however have much less ammo than the SB2U-3 for the 50 cals. But it does offset it to some degree that the Dauntless has better handling and thereby easier can get the target in front of the machine guns. At battle rating 3.3 and 3.7, we find the end of the line for the American dive bombers, with the SB2C 1C and the SB2C 4, also called Hill Diver. Again, a great name. The battle rating 3.7 SB2C 4 has a slightly more powerful engine, which you will not notice, but more importantly, a much better and interesting bomb blow compared to the battle rating 3.3 SB2C 1C. And just like I suggested with the SB2Us, upgrade to the second model as fast as you can. There's really no task this dive bomber cannot do and do it well. Let's look at some of the pros and cons. Some of the pros. 
fly characteristics. The hell diver has a top speed of 469 km an hour, reached at 6,000 meters. Turn time is good with 23 seconds clean and 26 seconds with a bomb load. The wings are not as strong as the ones found on the SP2Us or the Dauntless, but still good enough with just over 650 km an hour. Combat and takeoff flap limits are great with 503 and 481 km an hour. Landing flap limits are again lower than the previous two dive bombers with a more regular 250 km an hour. The landing gear is not as strong either, but still is strong enough with over 330 km an hour. On paper, the Hell Diver has a very bad rate of climb with only 6 meters per second empty and you can cut that in half with a bomb load. However, playing it is just fine. The Hell Diver has a strong engine and I was more or less just as good climbing with the Hell Diver as I was with the Dauntless. One last thing to note that will also surprise some people is how agile and good at rolling the Hell Diver is. Armament The Hell Diver has a very strong offensive armament with two 20mm cannons. Defensively, it's like the Dauntless with a twin light machine gun setup. Bomb load. The last Hell Diver has great secondary weapons options with a lot of variety. It also has an internal bomb bay in addition to the bomb racks under the wings. And more about that in a bit. Armor protection. The pilot is protected with bulletproof glass in front of him. The top portion of the engine in front of him has armor protection. And so has the back of his seat. The engine also has an armor plate at the bottom of the engine compartment. The rear gunner has been downgraded protection wise. He only has some small armor plates protecting his face on the twin MG mount. Dive brakes. And of course the hell diver has those as well. And in my opinion the only con, slow-ish. At better rating 3.7 the 469 km an hour is not the greatest anymore and it cannot outrun basically anything but a bomber. The rear gunner of the Hell Diver has the same setup as on the Dauntless, but the guidances are worse. The horizontal guidances are much lower here with plus minus 50 degrees, and also vertically it's worse with plus 50 and minus 5 degrees. And just like the other dive bombers, it suffers from the ability to not shoot to the left and right of the vertical stabilizer. On the offensive side, the Hell Diver is a large upgrade over the Dauntless. Here we have two 20mm cannons. With a recent change to armor penetration for some guns, the US 20mm cannon has become even more powerful. There are five builds to choose from, but with only two different shells. High explosive and armor piercing. And it's really up to you to find out which mix of the two shells you want to use. The armor piercing shell has great armor pin and can even at 500 meters pin 29mm. The cannons have 400 shells total and with their destructive power that's more than enough to deal with a great number of targets. The Hell Diver also has a great variety of secondary weapons. It can carry 250, 500 and 1000 pound bombs. It can also carry rockets, gun pods, sea mines and a torpedo. This makes this last sb 2 c 4 the most versatile of all of the US dive bombers and probably one of the most versatile aircraft in War Thunder when it comes to secondary weapons. It is pretty incredible what it can do. As I mentioned, the Hell Diver has a very good rate of roll even at lower speeds. This means that it very quickly can go into a dive. This also means that you with the Hell Diver can get into a very steep dive. Here I am starting the roll as I did with other dive bombers at the leading edge of the wing. As I mentioned with the Dauntless, normally when you get into an almost vertical dive, just pull out of it, it's not worth it and it's really not. I did also mention that you needed to aim below the target if you were in such a steep dive and I can show you how that looks. To get what I would call a good dive with the Hell Diver, I suggest you wait a second to start the roll when the target is around where the pilot is located, or count to one after the leading edge of the wings. That should more or less give you a direct hit with the wing mounted bombs.
Since the hill diver has a bomb bay, remember to open it first or nothing will happen when you try to drop the center bomb. You instead just open the bomb bay itself. But if you realize it fast enough, just hit the bomb key again and the bomb will drop. So because the hell diver has a bomb bay, there is no cradle for the center bomb and it does change a little where you need to aim with it. If you do the same rollover point as with the wing mounted bombs, so around where the pilot sits, I found out that if you aim slightly below the target, it should more or less hit dead on with both the 500 and 1000 pound bomb. In air battles, the hell diver can destroy a single base on a regular map. Around this battle rating on an operations map, you can destroy about two thirds of a base, with the largest bomb load consisting of the two 500 and one 1000 pound bomb. The main issue for the hell diver is getting to the target in the first place. It's not very fast in level flight, so in my opinion, the best bet is to put it in a slight dive, which will still give you the benefit of some altitude arriving over the base. You can of course also dive very steeply towards the base and just level bomb it, but you will then have robbed yourself of the option of maneuvering when it comes to being able to defend yourself after you have dropped the bombs. But of course, that also depends on which map you are on and where the baddies are, so both need to be considered. So after you have bombed the base, if you are still at altitude, you can try to look for other bombers or fighters to play with. The 20mm cannons will make quick work of them. Alternatively, you can go ground pounding with the 20mm cannons, and also here they're great. I think where the hell diver is most effective is in mixed battles. Here both the bomb loads and the rockets can be great, and also of course the 20mm cannons. I usually go with the four 500 pound bombs, since that will give you three separate bomb drops. The wing mounted bombs drop first, and the two remaining 500 pound bombs in the bomb bay drop one at a time. The 20mm cannons are great for both destroying tanks from the top down and to blow up enemy aircraft with. Although the hell diver is slow, it is surprisingly agile and if you also use the flaps, you can surprise the enemy fighters without turning them.
My recommendations for the dive bombers will be quick. Research, but do not use the first of the SB2Us, the SB2U-2 at Battle Rating 1.0. Instead, use the Battle Rating 1.7, SB2U-3. The difference in firepower between the two models is quite staggering. The Dauntless is both a step up, but also a downgrade firepower-wise without the gun parts. It also has a slightly lighter bomb load compared to the SB2Us. On the other hand, it has superior flight performance, so it's up to you to decide. They are both great in their own ways. The best of all the dive bombers is found at better rating 3.7. Again research, but do not use the first of the hell divers found at better rating 3.3, the SB2C C1. The better rating 3.7 SB2C4 is far superior when it comes to the secondary weapons, and it has a slightly more powerful engine. But that was about it for this guide. I hope you found it useful. If you like the video and the content on the channel in general, do me a favor and like, subscribe and comment. You can also go the extra mile like Grouchy Old Man and support the channel in a more direct way. I have opened a shop on Spreadshop.com where merchandise for the channel logo is available. More designs will follow soon. Thank you for watching and until next time, remember to deploy your die breaks. Have a good one.